Okay, open up our Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 3. Someone said, when you read God's Word, you must constantly be saying to yourself, it is talking to me and about me. When God's Word is opened up, we should be more concerned about it speaking to us personally than to our spouse next to us or to someone else that we know could really use this message if they were only here. See, the Word is for us personally. When I first got saved, it was just amazing how God spoke to me because the Word of God is alive it says it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's, it's able to penetrate uh, to the mind, to the bone, the marrow, the intent of the heart. And boy, did it, 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 it like spoke right to me. Whenever I would sit in, in services, it was like a, a tunnel vision. It just directed right at me. Oftentimes, I'd even uh, ask myself, did this guy talk to somebody? He seems to know a little more about me than, I, than I'm comfortable with, you know? And so when the Word of God is spoken, it should be spoken to us. Because God is speaking to us. Now, in this chapter, it speaks about the last days, scoffers that will be coming in the last days, and they will be twisting the scriptures to meet their own benefits. And so we will get into those topics in a couple of weeks in the main points, but I want to get into some particulars this morning, especially concerning the love of the brethren and also the importance of the word of God. The first few verses here do encourage us uh, to be in the Word of God and the importance of the Word of God in our lives. And and I know that um, as believers, we should be having a daily devotional with the Lord. Uh, Whether we wake up or we take some time in the afternoon or even in the evening where we just sit down and it's just one-on-one with the Lord. The Word of God is important, and and we can't just cast it off. We, We need to be in it daily. I was watching a little video of a Yankees game, New York Yankees. They hit a ball into the, the stands and this father actually caught the ball. You know how exciting that is, right? A professional game, you catch the ball, you're jumping up and down, you're, everyone's screaming and yelling, the crowd around you screaming and yelling, you know, and you, you're the one with the winning ball or whatever ball, you know, that, the person that hit it and so forth. It means a lot to you. It's valued to you. And so everyone's screaming and yelling, and his daughter, who's probably about this high, blonde hair, blue eyes, she's about six to eight years old, she reaches out and says, let me hold it, Daddy. And so he goes and he gives it to her. You know what she does? She grabs the ball and she throws it back into the field. <laughs> she's like, well, Dad, this isn't your ball. You know, it belongs to them. So she threw it back into the field. Now, they, thank God they, they grabbed the ball and they gave it back to him. But I thought, what a neat analogy of the Word of God. You know, the Word of God is an exciting thing when, when it gets a hold of your life. And you want to share it with a lot of people. But oftentimes when you share it with others, they just grab it and they go, I don't want this, and they just throw it away. It's not important to them. They don't think that it's valuable enough to keep. They might even think, well, it doesn't belong to me. That's God's work, and that's the Christian faith, and so it doesn't apply to me. I don't, I don't need its principles or it telling me what I need to do and so forth, and that's so far from the truth. When I was raising my boys, I have four boys, four blood boys. I have one adopted son, and um, I made sure that I took the word of God and I drilled them with it. We were in it every day. We were having devotions at night. We would read through the New Testament. If they were playing video games, if they played a half an hour of video games, they needed to be reading a half an hour of the Bible. I wanted them to know that the Bible was important. It had to be a part of their lives. We were always talking about the Bible. If we were having dinner together at the table, which is rare today, we'd talk about the Bible. I'd throw questions at them about the Bible. Uh, I'd, I'd challenge them. Is that something the Christian would do? You know, and so forth. We go to places in the car. We talk about the Bible. We play Bible games. We filled their lives with the Bible. We drilled it into them. And thank God, through His grace, that every one of my sons, you know, are serving the Lord. They're serving the Lord. They're involved in ministry, and they know the Bible. My adopted son just recently uh, texted me. We had some difficulties, and that does come with adoption, by the way. You always have difficulties because you have an individual that's coming into a new home and they're struggling, you know, with their identity, 
whether they belong, do people really love me, you know, just all, all of those things. And some of you might be adopted or know of people like that. And it's a hard place to be. And so he really, he, he really struggled. Well, he struggled so much that he actually caused some major problems in, in our church. And of course, you know, he's a teenager and he knows everything like teenagers do and he's in the right and so forth. Well, he went into the Air Force <clears throat> and periodically he will... He will text me to see how I'm doing, you know, see how the church is doing. In the beginning, it was kind of like, how's the church? Is it growing? You know, kind of, a, kind of like, uh, did I succeed type of thing and cause it to, you know, fall, you know? And so I said, no, the Lord's good. You know, we've got a lot of new people, two services now. And, you know, and then he would say, I'm sorry. And he'd just say, I'm sorry. And I got a text Friday night, and he actually kind of wrote a, a lengthy little a little thing there saying, you know, I know that as a growing up uh, in, the, in your house, it was a godly house, a, God, a house that served the Lord, and you taught your biblical principles to me. And he says, I appreciate that now. And I just want to apologize, you know, for what I've done. I'm sorry, you know. So now he's getting older, and he's seen the value of it. So hang in there. You know, I know that sometimes it seems like you're drilling your kids, and you're telling them biblical principles, and it seems like they're rebelling, they don't want to hear it, but in the end, they'll always accept it because they'll find that it's valuable to them. You know, they won't just cast it off like that little girl, you know. It's valuable. The Bible's believer commentary said this, they should remember the prophecies of the Holy prophets found in the Old Testament, and they should remember the teachings of the Lord as conveyed through the apostles. This is preserved in the New Testament. And so old and new, getting into the word of God, and we'll get more into it as we, we get into these two verses. The Bible is the only true safeguard in the days of confusion. And boy, we're living in days of confusion, aren't we? we this is a days of confusion. We have this this confusion in the church itself, within the church itself. It's amazing how confused we are over truth and over the valuableness of the Bible itself. I was watching another video, and there was a preacher, and he was preaching on a street with his Bible out, and he's talking to the audience about the sin of homosexuality. Now, that is a sin according to the Bible. I don't know what his intent was. I don't know if he's bringing judgment on them and so forth. I, I really couldn't hear everything. But it, he was, in a sense, telling them, you need to repent because you're a sinner and you need God, which is love, in a sense. The Bible tells us that people need to know that they're sinners and they fall short of God's standards, but that God has provided a way through his son, Jesus Christ. And so he's preaching this. Well, another group of Christians come along, and they don't like the fact that he's coming down on homosexuality. And so they start singing a song. And so they're singing about how he loves us, you know, and they're all singing how he loves us. I can't sing, so how he loves us, you know, and they're getting louder and louder, and they're trying to drown him out because they feel his message is a hate message, and God just loves us all, whether you're homosexual or not. Now, there's some confusion there, isn't there? Uh, there's a great debate over that. You know, I, I'm not going to tell you what's right or what's wrong. You have to decide for yourself. I have my convictions, you know, and my thoughts according to Scripture because I've studied it. I looked at it. I know what Scripture says, you know, just as being a drunkard is, is sin in the eyes of God. So is homosexuality. But at the same time, we need to reach them with God's love because he loves them so much. And it's not that we hate them. We hate the sin, whether it's homosexuality, whether it's drugs, whether it's pornography, whatever it is, it's sin and it destroys not, not God, it destroys them. And God loves them enough to get them out of it. So there's a lot of confusion. And so we need to know the Bible. We need to be in the Word of God. So Peter begins this chapter with his purpose for writing in verses 1 and 2. And so I'm going to get into these little side notes, which I think are important. I think God, through the Holy Spirit, put everything in the Scriptures so that we can learn from them some principles. Though there is a meat here, and that meat is it's concerning the days of the Lord that is coming. And from what we see around us, maybe real soon. And I'm excited about that, and I'm sure that you are too. So he says in verse 1, Beloved... I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. Now, looking at the word beloved there, let's just stop and look at that word itself. It's mentioned 
four times in this chapter alone, which means there's some value to it. We need to look at it. And so Peter here uses the word beloved. It's agapatos, meaning dear or dear friend or dear to one's heart. Now he uses it in a different sense than the Apostle John. The Apostle John, I, I think, is, is a guy that's a very emotional, touchy-feely type of guy, you know? He's the type of these guys that when he's talking to you, he gets close to you like this, and then he's touching your arm, and you're trying to walk away, and then you, then you put something between you. Okay, now that's some distance, you know? But he just liked getting close and liked to touch. He was the one that put his head on, on Jesus' shoulder there at the Last Supper. Nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying anything wrong. Peter's not that way, though. He doesn't use the same word. He's using that, you're my brother, I love you dearly, uh, I'm concerned for you, I want you to be warned, I have some teaching, correct, whatever it is. And John's more like, you're my children, oh, I love you guys to death, give me a big hug, you know, and that type of thing. But Peter is a different person, he's, he's not as attached as John there. So he uses this word believe, or beloved, and he's using it in the sense that I really do care for you. I really do care for you. Isn't it interesting how we all have different personalities? Now, God made us that way, and he made us that way for a reason. Some of us are very loving. Some of us are, you know, don't touch me. It doesn't mean that they don't love, that they don't have feelings or emotions. They just show it differently. And sometimes we allow our different personalities to get in the way of how we love one another. And we need to learn to just accept one another doesn't matter where we came from, what ethnic background we had, or what education or lack of education we had. We have to just learn to love one another and accept one another and not judge one another. Sometimes we walk away and we go, that guy's weird. It's like, I don't know what's wrong with him. He just thinks weird. I was at the park, whoop, I was at the park uh, Friday night, and um, there was a guy there with a little video camera. He's just sitting back, and he's just kind of like laying there relaxed. And I thought I had seen him there before, but I thought he was new at the same time. So I just started a conversation to see where he was at. And I said, hey, so you here with one of the bands? And he's just like, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm here. Bands. And I'm like, okay. I go, so what band? He goes, ah, I don't know yet. Um, I don't know what their name is. Uh, I'm like, okay. So, so what are you doing? I see you got a camera. He goes, yeah, we're a, I'm with a magazine. I'm putting some things together. Okay, like what? You know, what magazine? Well, you know, I, I've gone to Calvary Chapels. And he's just like really elusive. Finally, I figured it out, man. That guy's tweaked out. He's just gone. His brain is gone, you know, and he was just like all over the place. And I could have just walked away like, boy, this guy's gone. Forget it, Lord. You have no way of reaching this individual, you know. And sometimes we walk away from people like that because they're different, you know. They're not quite the same. We set up our cliques like that, don't we? We get like-minded people. We got a little click. Oh, no, you don't belong here. You don't think like us and so forth. That's not good. We should be willing to extend our hands to anybody. We should be able to love one another just as we are. God loves us all. He values every one of us all. He died for every one of us. He gave his son for you, for you and you and you, all of us. It didn't matter where you came from. You all had a need, and that was for God's sacrificial offering on the cross. And so valuing one another, and really that's the key is our value of one another. And that's why we stress it even in the culture today with bullying, you know, the fact that we have bullying laws now. And now the schools are, are gearing up to teach children not to be bullies against others because of peer pressure and, and so forth. We, we heard a couple of testimonies Friday night from some of the, uh, the bands and even my son who shared about the peer pressure in high school. Uh, that they go through, and then they make bad decisions because of that peer pressure. Peter here is concerned for the flock. He loves the, the flock. He's a pastor. He's a teacher. He values them very much, and he really wants to expose his heart to them and, and yet draw their hearts closer to him because he wants them to know that he cares about them. And people don't care how much you know. They just want to know how much you care. And if you care for them, then they're willing to listen to you. You invest time in their lives. Uh, you give them an ear. You meet some needs. And then they'll hear you. They'll listen to your wisdom because they see that you really care for them. And really, that's a healthy church. 
Uh, that's what God wants within the body of Christ. And when that happens, then other men outside will know that God's there. Because how do they know that we know God? By the love we have one for another. And that's what they want to see. I was reading an article about um, growing churches and what are the things within those churches that are unique. And one of those things was family. How a church makes you feel welcome. They make you feel a part of a family. They were, they were describing the Mormon church and how you can go to a Mormon church and you can become a part of their family. They really draw you in. They invite you to their houses. They invite you to their birthday parties. They invite you to the church to play sports. They're very active with family. And that draws in a lot of people. Now that's in a bad sense because they're being drawn in the wrong direction. We should use that within the church to draw us into the body of Christ and in, into one another's lives. Making connections, being accountable one to another, we really need to do that. When Virginia and I first got saved, we started going to a Calvary chapel. It was here in Maryloma at the time. It no longer is here. And one of the things that, that made me uh, like it, the second thing, the first thing was that the word was being taught. The second thing was is that people loved you sincerely. I remember walking through the, the doors for the first time. Coming from a Catholic background, though, so you have to understand this. You know, never being touched. And I'm not a touchy-feely guy. Though I'm learning. I'm learning to do that more. I mean, God is breaking down those walls in my own life, and so I do hug a little bit, but not as much as I probably should. So here I walk through the doors, and there's this big guy. Mitch Dalton is his name. A huge guy. And he goes, hey, brother. And he grabs me, and he hugs me. And he lifts me up the ground, and I'm going, let me go what kind of place is this you know just like wow but that and then others inviting me to their home us to our their home and having lunch after church and all of a sudden we created relationships and to this day we still have relationships we have a brother that comes here in the first service that just started within the last month so i i first went to that church and he was there and we still have this relationship and so creating relationships, loving one another is so important. And we have all those different aspects of it all. We really need to think about these things in the last days. How much do we really love and care about one another? So he continues and says in the next statements <laughs> after that one word, I now write to you the second epistle in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. The word stir means to arouse, to, to wake you up fully uh, out of sleep, whether, whether literally out of sleep, the word can be used, or spiritually. And here, Peter is speaking spiritually. We shouldn't be sleeping. We, we should be awake. We should be active. And it's not talking about just relaxing. It's talking about doing something. Get busy with the gospel. Now, he mentions a second, uh, a first letter here. The first epistle was obviously 1 Peter. This is 2 Peter, but there is some debate between commentaries. They believe that there is a, a letter possibly missing uh, because in 2 Peter, he's directed to a church or an individual, and in 1 Peter, he's directed to a, a group of churches or, and, and people, a wider audience. And so the fact that he's mentioning it in 2 Peter to an individual, there might be another letter out there to this individual, some believe. We're not sure, but what we have, we need to you know, read and study and listen to it. But he wants to stir up their pure minds. The word pure there means sincere. It was used in the secular world of Plato to speak of ethnic purity or pure reasoning, uncontaminated uh, minds that were seduced by other influences outside of their, their thoughts. Free from falsehood is what Peter is saying here. He's saying, I want to stir up your minds that have been in the word of God, that know the truth of God, and I want to stir that up in you. You might have been listening to these false teachers and these false prophets. You might have read some articles. You, you might have heard of some things. But I want you to get back to the fundamentals, the simplicity that it's in Christ Jesus in way of remembrance. There seemed to be a, a mixture uh, uh, of teachings that were going around at that time and Peter was concerned for the believers they get back to that simplicity 
of the scriptures. They have a pure mind, that uncontaminated, unmixed mind that was seduced by the flesh, by the devil himself, and so forth. In fact, the present tense indicates Peter's desire was to continually wake his reader and to stimulate their wholesome thinking. That's the whole purpose of coming to church, is to wake up, to expect God to speak to us. You know, we should be here expecting God to say something to us, not, not just putting in our time. That's religion. Uh, religion is I need to go to church on Sunday just to put my time in and then I can go home from there. No, it's coming and saying, Lord, I have some needs. I have some questions. Uh, I expect you to do something. I expect you to speak to me today and nobody else. I want you to say something to me. Uh, every year, I have a prayer every year, and I prayed it every year. And one of the reasons that I've prayed this is because I know me. I know my personality. I'm an A-type. When, when I get a hold of something, I, I don't let go of it. I want to experience it to its fullest. Uh, I'm into, well, I was into sports till I got hurt. And, and so whenever I took up a sport, I mean, I went all the way. I took up softball, so I bought all the latest softball equipment. I even bought weighted balls so I could learn how to throw a weighted ball. And when I threw the regular ball, it was easier to throw. I mean, I got into all the gloves, the hats, the pants, the socks, you know, just everything. It's just the way I am. And I thought to myself, am I going to do the same thing with Christianity? Am I going to get so into it and then all of a sudden something else will interest me and I'll leave it? And so I was concerned And so every year I'd say, Lord, help me to learn something new this year. Help me to experience you in a fresh way. Help me, Lord, to not get bored, but help me to grow every year with something different. I expect you to do that in my life. And he has done that for the past 26 years, has just blown me away. Even this year has just blown me away at what the Lord has done in this little church here. And I'm expecting him to do the same in the coming up years. You know, uh, it wasn't, what, a year, two years ago, a year and a half ago, we probably had about 60 people here. We had one service. And because of some situations that took place, uh, a lot of those people left. Now, the Lord had warned me. We had been praying and fasting and seeking the Lord for a week-long church event. A lot of those people were here. And the Lord gave me a word and saying, people will be leaving and not just a few a lot and so I was prepared and because I knew that was the Lord I trusted in him and so when it happened and it happened in a bad way but it happened and I was just at total peace I'm like okay Lord that's exactly what you said was going to happen that's so strange but he he told me I've got something great for you something better for you And, and there were those that saw this and were then like questioning well do you know what you're doing you know, what's going on? It must be you and, and you know, just all these questions. And I'm sh- reasonable. It's reasonable when something like that happens. And I'm like, I'm just telling you what God said. And this is exactly what happened. But then within time, boom, things just changed. It was almost like within a month, we doubled in size. We went from 60 to now where we have about 170 people now. You know, we have two services, we have patios, we have canopies, we have a home here, we have, you know, and it's like, wow, Lord, you are so good. And it has nothing to do with me. It's God and experiencing God and saying, Lord, here we are, use us. That's faith in the work of God, not faith in ourselves. You know, because we oftentimes want to have faith in ourselves. We want to have faith in our abilities. Well, guess what? It doesn't work that way. See, the, the Lord tells us in the, in the Proverbs, right, that a man plans his ways, but it's the Lord that numbers his steps. And so I'd rather have the Lord's way than my own way and so forth. But we need to expect him to minister to us. And when you expect him, as he says, if you draw nigh to me, if you draw near to me, then I promise I will draw near to you. But if you don't expect him to say anything to you, he probably won't say anything to you. He probably won't. He will let you have what you want. Brother mentioned the Jordan uh, situation as the children of Israel were to go across the Jordan into the land of promise, the land of Canaan there. So you have the Reubenites and the Gadites, and they decided, well, we're not going to go. And so the rest of the tribes were a little upset and said, let's go back and let's just kill these guys, a bunch of you know, knuckleheads. They abandon us. They're traitors. You know? So they're running back to kill them. Here's the brotherly love, right? You know, these guys are wrong. And then they get there. So, oh, no, 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 we love you guys. We'll help you. We just don't want to go over there. 
oh, okay, then help us. But you help us until we conquered it. And they did. They helped them and they conquered and they set up a little memorial and the whole bit. But they went back to the other side. They didn't want what God fully wanted. They didn't expect God to give them more. These were the same people when Jesus crossed over the Sea of Galilee to Gesereset and he found the, the man in the tomb and the pigs and swines. They ended up going into uh, this unkosher, idolatrous, satanic kind of worship because they didn't want what God fully wanted them to have. You remember that story, and then the, uh, the man uh, you know, was possessed with demons, and Jesus cast him into the swines, and they went over the side. That's what happens. When we don't expect God to do something, he'll give you what, you're, what you expect. And if it's nothing, it's nothing you get. You know, so we need to expect God, and, and believe me, that's faith in God. And when he sees you activating your faith, he responds to that. He loves that because then he gets the glory because you know, I didn't do that. I didn't do that at all. You know, when we bought this building uh, several years before that, it's been eight years now, something like eight years, the owner came here, said, I'm selling the place. You guys need to move out. You know, just a, a long story short, a lot of you already know it. Um, so he was going to put a sign here. And we're just praying. We're seeking where to go. We have no place to go. We were thinking trough school there, a lot of work going in and out. You know, we, we thought it was over, but I just, Lord, you're in control. You know what you're doing. We just prayed. We sought the Lord. Well, the owner came here. He talked to the people. He talked to me. He came and sat in the church. I happened to be teaching about how hard it is for a rich man to, come, to enter the kingdom of God. He was so convicted. Now, is that me or God? That's God. Because I expect God to work. I don't expect me to have the right answers and the, or the right questions, you know, and so forth. He came out afterwards and said, you did that on purpose. I, go, I didn't even know you were showing up. Plus, we go through the Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, so I had no idea. He called me that Tuesday and said, I need to help you to get that building. You know, he goes, what, what do I need to do? Do you think I'll be able to get to heaven? <laughs> yeah. So I shared the gospel with him. I shared the gospel with him. And we bought a $200,000 building and he sold it to us for one thirty-five. And then someone else came in and said, I'll lend you the twenty as long as I can hold the note. So we ended up came up with 10000 We only owe one hundred and five on the on the property now. That's God. That is God. When you expect God to work, he, he works. He works. But if you don't expect him, he's not going to work. And so Peter's encouraging the believers, wake up out of sleep, get busy. Don't just... Just don't be lackadaisical, you know, just kind of going along your Christian walk. You know, expect God to do something good today, and he will do it. He promises that. Now, in the context, we do know that he's talking about the day of the Lord. We know that the end is coming. He wants to equip the saints for that day. And so he, he's doing this writing in that context. And so some of the teachings that, that he's going to share is is concerning the last days. And so when we get to verse 2, when he talks about those things that he wants to bring to remembrance, he says that you be mindful of the words, highlight that, which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. So he wanted to bring to their remembrance the words, plural, the, the, the disclosures, the meanings of the Old Testament and the New Testament from him and from the prophets and from the apostles of the end times because that's the context that's here. Though it's important that we understand the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation. So Peter's first intent here is that the reader get to know the Old Testament. Get to know the book of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. You know, get to know those books, Ruth, you know, uh, Judges, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, you know, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, the Psalms, and then the major uh, prophets and the minor prophets. Get to know those books. Come out on Wednesday nights. We're going through Jeremiah right now. And so it gives you an idea of what God is saying to the children of Israel and how it reflects to us today concerning the end times. It's important that we get into that word. In fact, Peter mentioning the fact of the Old Testament here, he's putting the value of it in line with the New Testament. He's giving himself authority, saying we're just as authoritative as those in the Old Testament. I'm talking Jeremiah. I'm talking Isaiah. You know, I'm talking about great prophets of God. 
And Peter's saying, we're just like them. We have the same message to give out, and you need to know that message of God. Jeremiah uh, 23, 5, he said, behold, the days are coming. Behold, the days are coming. Boy, that's exciting to know. Do you know the days are coming? Look around us and what's happening today. It is coming. It is crystal clear how close it is. It's so close, and the Bible talks about how in those days that it will come as a thief in the night. And, and so you have to wonder, that means that we won't know it when it comes. So in a sense, we know it's coming, but in a sense, I almost feel like a lot of us are going to say, it's not coming, and then boom, he comes, you know, at the same time. Uh, I just read an article that the police officers now have a, a scanner, a new scanner, and when they scan you for speeding, they can also see if you're texting. It reads, reads your texts. And then I was reading another article that through the Obamacare, one of the things they want to do is, is implant every person with an implant uh, within three years so they can keep track of your medical records and so forth. iPhone now, the iPhone 6, it has an app on here. You can put all your credit cards on here. So you don't need credit cards anymore. You just go to the store and you just bring it up and scan it and it's done. Uh, Starbucks already has it. They just, they just scan my phone and it already comes off of the card that, that I just reload automatically. I don't even have to do anything. As soon as it gets to a certain amount, it reloads the card for me. I do nothing. So American Express, Well, Fargo is already sending me requests to have the app put on there because I have an account with Wells Fargo. Chase is doing the same thing. And, and so now you go to the store just with your phone and you go up and you buy your clothes and you're done. You know, there's your picture. They see who you are and, you know, your fingerprint. I can push this phone and I just put my finger on there and it opens it up instead of a, a pass ID from my fingerprint. It's amazing what technology we have today. It's clear. The Lord is coming. I can almost see it. They push uh, the scanner and they say, okay, guys, speeding, 85 miles an hour, flying fish. You know, flying fish, Christian fish on the bumper, flying fish. <laughs> flying fish he's texting you know and it says god bless you <laughs> and we know who he is and what church he goes to because they have all his information right there you know and in the last days it talks about the mark of the beast right now that will happen during the tribulation period we'll be out of the scene at that time the church will be raptured up but that mark of the beast will probably be implemented during the time of the tribulation especially if we all have the mark of whether an implant or some other device on us. Now, the question is, so do we do these things? I mean, should I get that app with the cards? I'm going to. I mean, I love the Lord Jesus Christ. I hate the devil. You know, I'm not giving him my life, but it is sure as convenient for me, especially somebody that's just so busy running around doing this and that. It's just convenient for me. But there's going to be a time where we're going to have to have a choice. That choice will come during the tribulation period, I believe when that mark is going to be given out and you will have to decide whether you want to follow God or follow the beast and I think that's when you have to say nope I will follow God I'm not going to take the mark I think it's going to be that clear because the devil wants you to verbally say that you reject Jesus Christ he wants God to hear you say that that's why the, the ISA the Hamas whole thing is demonic you know they, they, they force you to say I reject can't against Christianity. I am Islam now. They want everyone to hear that. It's so important for them to hear that. And I think that's going to be the devil. I don't think the mark is here yet, though ooh, it is a little scary, you know, especially when you happen, why is my mark 666, huh? You know, like your address, you know, something like that. So we see the signs, and it's really time to wake up. And that's what Peter is saying. Look at the Old Testament. Look what the prophets said. Look at the prophecies concerning the Son of Man and Him coming in the last days. And Peter's desires for the reader to hold fast to these beliefs, uh, not to sway to or fro. There were some, uh, those that were teaching that the end was not coming, whether they were Hellenists or even the agnostics later on, came around and said, Christ isn't coming back. Even the Thessalonians, one of the struggles they had was they thought they missed the rapture and that they were stuck you know, because they were still there. And so they're really concerned. And so Peter's encouraging him, no, it hasn't happened yet. You will know. Read the Old Testament. Read the words that God has given to us, the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will know when that time comes. Be encouraged. The importance of the Bible and us being in the Bible 
is very important for us as believers. We should be in the word of God on a daily basis. I know that we're blessed here in America. We have the, the radio, we have television, we have the technology to put it onto our phones and listen to it all day. I know several here who have gone through Chuck's tracks, you know, back in tapes. They download it, they listen to it all day. It's wonderful, and that's what we should be doing. But we should be drawing closer to the Lord on a daily basis. We should have a devotional where we sit down and it's just us and the Lord. And we're reading his word and we're just asking him to speak to us in this devotion. It's important for our growth, for our faith, so that we can be used of God even for our equipping. The Bible talks about two things, justification and sanctification. The justification is done through the work of Jesus Christ. What he has done on the cross for us, our salvation and eternal Uh, destiny is set in that work. That's justification. We don't have to do anything for that. But then there's sanctification, and all of us are being sanctified right now. We're not perfect. We still have flaws. There are things that we're all dealing with, you know, some truths that we won't accept. And we know they're truths, but we just don't want to accept them yet. And God is working in our lives. That's sanctification. That's a work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And it's our work, too, because we need the desire to change. If you're not, again, here's, here's that thought principle. If, if we don't desire to change, if we don't desire to grow, you won't grow. You'll, you'll stay exactly where you're at, you know. Uh, you'll be like a, a kid that never wants to learn how to eat, and he's 30 years old, and he's still at home eating the, the dinner that his mom makes, you know. He just hasn't grown up yet, and so forth. So we need to grow in our sanctification and so forth. The importance of the Bible. Our founding fathers understood this. Our, our founding fathers of America, they knew the work of God that was being done here, the importance that they did it right. And they sought the Lord to do it right. They prayed daily. They fasted daily. They were in the scriptures and so forth because they wanted to have a nation that was governed by God and God alone and no other man. And they set up principles and, and laws and, and our constitution in such a way that it guaranteed all of that. And we have people today destroying it, ignoring it, trying to change it constantly, you know, adding to the, uh, the Constitution with uh, amendments and, and so forth. There's so many amendments, it's crazy. People don't normally know this, but our founding fathers had a dilemma when they began to choose the curriculum for the education system. What are we going to do? How are we going to educate our children? In what fashion? And they came down with, with two options. One was the Greek model of education. The other was the Hebrew model of education. The Greek model really emphasized on the mind, thinking, reasoning, understanding things, the context of things, observing how situations work, you know, the intellect uh, of things. The only problem with, with that system is, is when you become intellect, when you become filled with knowledge, you just have more questions. They're kind of like that guy that I was talking about earlier who was tweaked up, you know, and just brain was wasted. That's how intellects are, you know. Have you ever thought about this? You know, like reality, what is it? That's deep, man. Well, what does that mean? Well, that, whatever you want it to mean, that's what reality is because my reality might be different than your reality. It's like, man, that is deep. So what is God? What do you want him to be? You know, and, and you can get into all this stuff, and it's just intellect. And they didn't want to go down that path. So they chose the Hebrew uh, education system, which, which emphasized character, righteousness, and virtue. And, and they did that through the scriptures. They realized that if, if you could raise an individual and, and raise them in such a way that they had character and they understood righteousness and they understood virtues, they'd be good leaders. They'd be good husbands and good wives. They would be people you could trust, you know, you could depend upon. These are the type of people you want running your nation and so forth. And so they chose the Hebrew way. If they chose the other way, an intellect, somebody was smart, figure out things. Hey, if we did this and manipulated that, then we could deceive them here and we can get this and we'd be richer, you know. And they just became corrupt intellects, you know, because they had no character or no moral values. They understood the value of the scriptures. Paul said that the scriptures were given by inspiration of God. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. He said it was profitable. Profitable. Jesus said man should live by the word of God. 
and not just by bread alone. Jesus himself lived the word of God. You know Jesus fulfilled the whole word of God? His whole life was the word because he is the word. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And that's Jesus. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. You know. And he gave us the right to become children of God. In verse 12 it says there. And so it's profitable for us for doctrine. That is truth and principles. Not just the Ten Commandments. There's more to it than just the Ten Commandments. Out of those Ten Commandments, you know, of loving God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, what does that mean? What does it mean with your mind? How do you fill your mind with God? Hebrews 12 talks about us, you know, dwelling upon those things uh, in our mind, not the worldly things, but trans- allowing it be, to be transformed by the Word of God. You know, we need to fill our minds so the the... Jews in Deuteronomy 6 talked about meditating upon the word in God day and night. So the Jews took it literally and said, oh no, we need to have the word of God on our head always. So they created this little box. They put the word of God in and they tied it around their heads. They call them phylactrophies. And they figured, okay, the word of God is right there on my forehead all day long. And they felt, okay, I satisfied uh, Deuteronomy 6. That's not what he was talking about. Not laying on your head. And then they started really getting religious because then they got bigger boxes with more scriptures. To see how scriptural I am? You know, because I got a big box here. That's not what it's about. It's in your head, into your heart. You know? And so, how do we get it in our mind? The doctrines, the principles of God. Also for reproof, for correction. We need to be reproved from time to time. It's a good thing. Proverbs tells us that when we're reproved, it's a good thing because we can grow. It reveals someone loves you. They care about you. They don't just let you go on to destruction, but they care enough to say, hey, you're headed towards destruction. Change your path, your way. And so the scriptures, again, personally rebuke you. I learn more about myself from the scriptures <laughs> as I read it. And I learn so much about how I don't follow the scriptures and how much I don't really love God and how much I really need to change. It rebukes me, it reproofs me. And I love that about the word of God. It's a washing of the word of God. It's great for instruction, again, in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Peter kind of builds on this. In Second Peter Chapter 1, he said in 3 and 4, concerning the word that his divine power was or has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So his word pertains to everything about life and godliness. Every aspect of life, not just some things, but everything, everything. You can go right to the word of God. You read Genesis and, and you see God walking with man. You see the fall of man. You see how man responded. And you can learn so much just from those stories there. Or from Moses and how he handled his leadership position. You know, or David as a young man tending the flock and depending on the Lord, fighting against Goliath. There's so many principles that we can learn from for our daily living, our daily lives, in our relationships with our spouses and so forth, if we have that desire. So Peter clearly believed that the word of scriptures were important, not just for him, but for the body of Christ. Warren Wisby said this, whoever robs you of God's word robs you of your future. That's why I love Calvary Chapel, because they go through the word of God. They don't talk on a topic and exhaust that topic. Uh, I've heard of churches teaching on marriage, And they will take six months to teach on marriage. And that's all they ever teach. And so everyone knows everything about marriage and all the ins and outs of marriage. But they have no relationship with Christ. They have no relationship with Christ. They don't understand sin. They don't understand how the relationship with Christ works. And so that marriage seminar for six months, really, there's no power behind it. They can't do it without Christ because they don't know Christ. But they know marriage. And they're working hard at keeping their marriage going, but it's all a work of the flesh and not a work of the spirit. But when you know Christ and the power of Christ and you know how God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and they work together in unity, in one accord, the triunity, one God, three 
separate persons. You see the relationship, how the Father is the head. Christ is submitted to the Father. The Holy Spirit reveals the Son. You're like, wow, that's a family. You see the Father who's the head of the family, the wife who submits to the husband, the children who glorify the family. You see the family right there in that principle. And when you know God, you know everything about life and that anything that pertains to it. It's amazing how great the Word of God is. Let me close. <clears throat> Don't throw out the Word of God. Don't be that little kid. Dad, nice hardball. <laughs> Just throw it back out in the field. You know, because it has no value to you. It's very valuable. And you need to apply it to your life. Are you ready? Because look around us. What's going on? The Lord is coming soon. But are you ready? Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you know Jesus Christ? And I'm not talking intellectually. I'm not talking about knowing him. I, I know the president of the United States. I know his name. I know where he lives. You know, I know a lot about him, but I don't know him personally. I've never had dinner with him. You know, I don't know what he smells like. You know, I don't know what his breath smells like, but I know what a lot of people breath smells like that I have relationships with. And same is true of, of Christ. When we get to know him, we know him personally. Don't discount that. Do you know the Lord? Let me ask the group to come on up here again and bless us with wonderful worship again. And I want to give you an opportunity to ask Christ as they squeeze up in here. Move me out of the way. <laughs> You're fine there? Okay. Give you an opportunity to ask Christ into your heart. I mean, do you, do you see the times? You see how close we are? Are you, are you ready for this? Are you ready for the Lord to return? If you're not ready, you know, raise your hand if you're not ready and you need to get ready. Anybody? You're all ready? Okay, you need to get ready. You need to get ready. One hand raised. Okay, so anyone else need to get ready? Get, their, get your life straight? I want to give you that opportunity. Amen. Another person. So let's stand. I want to pray for you. And then they'll close up with this blessed song father i just lift up my brother and sister to you lord they they recognize father that in their lives as they live them daily lord they're not ready lord and so i just want to pray for them right now father that that you would through your spirit lord through your work lord work in their heart and in their mind and change them lord so that they would desire to know you more deeply lord father that it would be your work and not their efforts lord god and lord that they would know that they're ready because they have a personal relationship with you lord as they draw nigh to you lord you draw nigh to them lord in a special way father i lift them to your throne and trust that you'll do the work lord father if there's anyone else here lord that doesn't know you i pray today they just come up forward and speak with fausto or pat and I, I, I just know that they would love to share with them how to know Christ. And so be willing. It's an important decision that you make to know Jesus. And we pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, listeners to the song. Oh, for a heart to praise my God. A heart from sin set free A heart that always feels that blood So freely shed for me A heart resigned, submissive make My great Redeemer strong Where only Christ is heard to speak where Jesus reigns alone. A heart in every thought renewed, full of love divine, perfect, right, and pure and 
get a copy of thine perfect sacrifice. No wounded conscience had to bleed and lay it before you. Fallen pieces of a life that can be renewed. A heart believing I'm redeemed by your sacrifice. Oh, for sin to be cast down in your holy name. A heart in every thought renewed And full of love divine Perfect, right and pure and good A copy of thine perfect Sacrifice Grace, grace, grace Grace that covers all my sin A heart in every thought renewed And full of love divine Perfect, right and pure and good A copy of thine perfect sacrifice Thine perfect sacrifice You guys have a great day. God bless you.